Romans 6.12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Sin comes from one of these three areas found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. You see, that's what tempted Eve in the garden. And that's how the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Temptations always involve the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. Now notice that two of these areas of temptation are from lust, which is what James 1 says, beginning with verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Now, you might be asking, well, what is lust? Lust is to have an eager, passionate, and an especially inordinate or sinful desire as for the gratification of the sexual appetite or of covetousness. Now, notice that lust resides in the flesh. As 1 John 2.16 says, the lust of the flesh. Ephesians 2.3 says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. You see, when you get saved, you're still living in your fleshly body, which means that you're going to have to contend with the lust of your flesh and the lust of your eyes, even after you get saved. Like Romans 6.12 says. Galatians 5.17 says much the same thing. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now since we have these lusts in the flesh and in our eyes, it is important for us to realize that these things don't go away after we get saved. They're still the strong desires of the flesh, and they always want to be satisfied. However, have you ever noticed that fleshly lusts are never truly satisfied? What pleasure is derived from fulfilling the lusts of the flesh is always temporary. If you give the flesh what it wants, you'll have to give it what it wants again as soon as the effects of the former sin have worn off. You see, the flesh is never satisfied. It usually must have more and have it in greater proportion as time passes. Now consider this illustration. A great bar of steel weighing 500 pounds, 8 feet in length, was suspended vertically by a small chain. Nearby, a common cork was suspended by a silk thread. Now the plan was to show that the cork could set the steel bar in motion. Of course, that seemed impossible. Well, the cork was swung gently against the steel bar, but no sign of movement. It was done again and again until at the end of 10 minutes, the bar gave some evidence that it was becoming uneasy. A slight tremor was noticed. But at the end of a half an hour, the great bar was swinging to and fro like the pendulum of a clock. Likewise, fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the eyes may seem that it will not move you away from the Lord. But with repeated fulfillment, you're going to find that your sin will have you tossed to and fro. Here's another example. A certain tyrant sith for one of his subjects, and he said to him, What's your employment? And the fellow said, I'm a blacksmith. He said, Well, then go home and make me a chain of such and such a length. So he went home, and it occupied him several months, and he had no wages all the time that he was making it. Then he brought it to the monarch. The monarch said to him, All right, go now and make it twice as long. Well, he did that and brought it up again. But the monarch said, Now go and make it longer still. And when he brought it up at the last, the monarch said, Take it, bind him hand and foot with it, and cast him into a furnace of fire. You know what that was? That was the wages of making the chain. Likewise, Fulfilling the lust of the flesh and of the eyes will cause you to be trapped in the bondage of your sin and destroyed. So the question is, what are we going to do about the lust in the flesh so that sin won't reign in our mortal bodies? Well, there are several things. 
The first things are negative, and the second things are positive. We'll just make mention of what they are, and we'll quote the verse. First negative thing, make no provision for the lusts. Romans 13, 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Here's the second thing. Deny worldly lusts. Titus 2.12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 1 Peter 2.11 puts it this way, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Well, here's a good example. A tall cowboy was sauntering around in a large department store. A sales girl asked him if she could be of any assistance. No, ma'am, he replied. I reckon not. I ain't never seen so many things I could do without. You know what? There are many choices which sin offers, but we can do without them all. Here's the next thing. Put off the old man. Ephesians 4.22 says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Here's another negative thing. Flee youthful lusts. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Here's another negative thing. Avoid the deceitfulness of riches. 1 Timothy 6.9 says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10 says, the love of money is the root of all evil. So those are some good negative things you can do to keep sin out of your Christian life. But here's some positive things that you can and should do. The first one is walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, you know, the beauty of this is that after a while, you're going to begin to experience a satisfaction in Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God that is lasting, satisfying, enjoyable, and not guilt-ridden and not corrupt. Rather, it's going to be holy, righteous, and deeply satisfying. There's a lady to whom we've been ministering, and she said recently, I still like my old sin, even though she knows that she can only enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You know what she needs to learn? She needs to learn the pleasures that are at the right hand of God. That's found in Psalm 16, verse 11. And she'll be more satisfied with these, and her desire for her old sin will diminish. Here's the next positive thing you can do. Do the will of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2 says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. And here's another positive thing. Live the crucified life. Galatians 5, 24 says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Remember what Galatians 2, 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. You see? And then here's another positive thing. Stay under sound doctrine, sound doctrinal preaching, and sound doctrinal teaching. 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to heap up those kind of lusts to itching ears by neglecting the sound doctrine of the Word of God. Now, if you do these things and avoid the other negative things that we talked about, God will help you as you avoid sin in your Christian life.